Hello all my dear students, I hope you all are doing good. So good morning to all of you, good afternoon to all of you, good evening to all of you, whenever you are watching the lectures. Now, last lecture we have started with CA Final Direct Tax, your fast track batch for 2023 and we have done few things of PGV. So let's take the discussion ahead of PGVP only. And to be precise, the discussion on depreciation which we have started in the last session. So today the first thing which we are going to do is the discussion of additional depreciation which is given on page number 2.4. So let me talk about additional depreciation now. Additional depreciation as I have told you in the last session there are four types of depreciation under the income tax law and one amongst them is additional depreciation. Now additional depreciation under the income tax law is given under section 32 subsection 1 clause 2a at the rate of 20%. Now. There are few questions which we need to answer over here. First, this additional depreciation is eligible to which SSE? Is it eligible to every SSE? The answer is no. It is only eligible to SSEs who are engaged in manufacture or production of any article or thing. So, you should be a manufacturer. Produce anything, that is all fine. You should be a manufacturer or a producer. Second business, you should be engaged in power generation or power distribution or power transmission. <laughs> You should be engaged in business relating to power distribution or generation or transfer. In short, you should be engaged in business related to power. So, if you are <coughs> doing any of the two business which I have told you, that is manufacturer or power generation or power distribution, then you are eligible for this benefit. What am I supposed to do? You are supposed to purchase and use a new plant and machinery. You are to suppose to acquire, install and use a new plant and machinery. The plant and machinery has to be new, new and new. Then you will get what? Apart from normal depreciation, you will get additional 20% depreciation. Sir, every year I will get 20% extra? No, no, no. Every year you are not going to get 20% extra. You will get in the year in which you purchase and put to use. It's a one-time benefit. It's not a benefit which is available every year. So, if I purchase a new machinery next year, then you will again get in the next year. For one machinery, one time. For one machinery, one time. So, in this year, I am purchasing one machinery. I will get 20% additional depreciation on that. Then on this same machinery, in the next year, I cannot get 20% extra. In the next year, in the next year, I will only get the normal depreciation. Suppose in the next year, I purchase another new machinery then I will get additional depreciation on that also, provided it is a new machine. <laughs> okay. So, the nature of business is manufacturer or power generation, power distribution, power transfer. What is the SSE supposed to do? SSC is supposed to acquire, install and use new plant and machinery, he will get 20% additional depreciation. Sir, usage is also important? Yes, use is important. If you just acquire and install and do not use, you will not get additional depreciation. Sir, what if I put to use for less than 180 days in the current year? Then you will get half depreciation this year and half in the immediately next year. So, suppose if I acquire and put to use a new plant and machinery for less than 180 days in the current year, then I will get 10% in the current year and 10% in the next year. That is 50% of the depreciation will be allowed in the current year, 50% will be allowed in the immediately next year. Don't worry about it, it's written over here. Okay. So, it's a one time benefit? Yes, it's a one time benefit for that plant and machinery. Okay. Now, listen carefully. There are certain machineries which the government has excluded from here. When I say excluded from here, it means you will not get additional depreciation on those, those machineries. Now, which are those machineries on which you do not get additional depreciation? Let me tell you. First of all, second hand machinery. You don't get additional depreciation. You will only get the normal depreciation. Second hand machinery is not eligible for additional depreciation. Second hand means second hand. Whether from India or whether imported, it doesn't matter. You can write over here. Even imported second hand would not be allowed. Would not be allowed. Would not be allowed. Would not be allowed. Even imported second hand would not be allowed. Okay. So, second hand is absolutely not allowed. Okay. Then comes a machinery which is kept in office premise or guest house or residential accommodation not allowed. 
we want machinery to be installed in factory, not at your house. Then ships not allowed, aircraft not allowed, vehicle not allowed. Ships, aircraft, vehicle not allowed, not allowed, not allowed. Regarding vehicle, I will be speaking few more things when I will be doing some questions. So, whenever I will be doing question, I will be, I have to speak few things about vehicle now. I am not saying that right now. Just try to remember these exclusions. I am just saying it once for you all, first of all. So, imported second hand, local second hand. Second hand is not allowed at all. Office premises, machinery kept in office premises, not allowed. Machinery kept in residential accommodation, not allowed. Ships not allowed, aircraft not allowed, road transport vehicle not allowed and any plant and machinery which is already allowed as 100% deduction. If you have bought some plant and machinery and you have claimed 100% tax benefit on that, you cannot claim additional depreciation on that. Sir, example, yes, I will give you an example. Suppose, suppose, suppose I have bought some machinery for my scientific research department. I am doing some scientific research and I have bought some machinery. So, you might be knowing that you might have done in CA inter also, in CA final also we will do in subsequent lectures. That if you are doing scientific research, you get benefit of 100% deduction on a set. So, I bought a machinery of 10 lakh rupees for scientific research. I took 100% deduction of 10 lakh. Now, that machinery cannot be eligible for what additional depreciation. That is what is written over here. Just check. That machinery should not be eligible for what additional depreciation. That is not allowed. Absolutely not allowed. Okay. Now, one doubt was raised by certain industries that if we are engaged in printing, then are we eligible for additional depreciation? So, the government said, yes, assessees who are engaged in printing are eligible for additional depreciation. Assessees who are engaged in printing and as well as publishing, they are also eligible. So, you should be either engaged in printing or you should be engaged in printing and publishing, you are eligible for additional depreciation. Yes, if you are engaged in only publishing, you are not printing anything, you are not printing anything, you are just publishing, you are a publication house, then you are not eligible for additional depreciation. So, as you engage in printing or printing and publishing are eligible for additional depreciation that is written in CBDD circular over here of 2015, you can check. So, this is what this section is all about. I will just raise some questions which you have to raise in your mind while revising. Nature of business, I have told you which are the nature of business. Second, nature of asset, I have told you which assets are included, which are not included. Rate of depreciation, 20%. Is it necessary to use? Yes. 50% will it happen? Yes. If it is used, put to use for less than 100 days, then 50% in the current year and the 50% in the next year. You can just go through it once. Now, we are moving ahead towards some dangerous discussion. Now, what are this dangerous discussion? You have to be very careful at this moment now. So, now we are discussing very important issues and that is what? Pay attention please. As we all know that in income tax law, we get depreciation based on which method? WD. WDV is the method based on which we get depreciation under the income tax law. So, the question is what is WDV? Is the term WDV defined under income tax law? The answer is yes. It is defined in section 43.6. Section 43.6 defines the WDV. What is WDV, sir? Let me tell you what is WDV. What is exactly WDV? So, WDV is equal to, as per section 43.6, it is actual cost of the asset minus depreciation actually allowed. So, this is what generally the WDV definition is there in accounts also. Whatever is the cost, you have to reduce depreciation from that. That is it. Now, what do I mean by depreciation actually allowed? The word important over here is actually allowed. Depreciation actually allowed means, it means that depreciation. That saves your tax. You have to pay attention please all of you. That depreciation we are talking about that is saving your tax. What do I mean by this? Now, what happens in accounts and what happens in tax? Suppose this is your p &L account okay, and there is some depreciation over here say 100 rupees. 
Now, when you compute your PCB income, what do you do? Please tell me all of you. What do you do while computing PCB income? You add this depreciation, right? And then what do you do? You reduce the depreciation as per what? Income tax act. So, suppose that is 150 rupees. So, this 150 rupees which you are reducing, is it allowed to you or not? Is it actually allowed to you or not? The answer is yes. Is it saving your tax or not? The answer is yes. This 150 rupees is saving my tax. So, the government is saying as simple as this. That depreciation which is saving your tax, that can be called as actually allowed. And something which is actually allowed has to be reduced from the WDV. You have to just understand this link. A depreciation which is you are saving your tax is actually allowed and something which is actually allowed has to be reduced from what? From the actual cost. This link has to be maintained. So, now this is what it is written in the provision also. If you go to the previous page, there is a provision over here. How to arrive at WDV for the next year? If you come to page number 2.3, as per section 43.6, WDV, the definition of WDV is given here in section 43.6. WDV means actual cost as reduced by depreciation actually allowed. Just write down over here. By putting a circle act beside actually allowed, actually allowed means that depreciation which saves tax. Okay. Now, you have to be very careful now with respect to this discussion. I am just going slightly in the corner so that I can show you the entire board properly. Now, pay absolute attention with respect to the next provision. It is a beautiful one. Great logic is required to understand this. Shall I start? Listen. What I said by default, you can only reduce that depreciation from the WDV of the asset, which is actually allowed to you. Okay. A depreciation which is not actually allowed to you cannot be reduced. But there are two exceptions under the income tax law. In those two exceptions, even though the depreciation is not actually allowed to you, still you have to reduce from the block. Listen carefully what I am saying. There are two exceptions under the income tax law where the depreciation is not actually allowed to you, but still you have to reduce from the block. Which are those two exceptions? First one I am explaining with the help of example and then I am saying the exception to you. This is the example which is there in front of you. Listen to the example very carefully. Then you will understand. This is your PNL account. Okay. You have purchased one furniture of 100 rupees. Furniture is depreciable at the rate of 10 percent. Okay. This is your sales of 100 rupees. This is your expense of 120 rupees. It means your expense is far greater than your sales. And this is your depreciation of 10 rupees. That is 100 into 10 percent. So now, if you see properly, your sale is 100. But your depreciation on your expense is 130, therefore there is a loss of 30 rupees. Right? Now, in income tax law, you do not treat this as a loss. You divide that into two parts. Do you remember that in CA term? The loss which is coming because of depreciation, that is 10 rupees, it will be called as UAD, unabsorbed depreciation. And the loss that is coming because of expense, that is 20 rupees, that will be called as business loss. So, you have to segregate the entire loss of 30 rupees into two parts. In accounts, you say loss as loss only. In accounts, we do not use the word business loss or unabsorbed debt. But in tax, it is not like that. In tax, you have to segregate that because the treatment is different for unabsorbed depreciation and business loss. So, you have to segregate the unabsorbed depreciation and the business loss. Okay. Yes, I have segregated, sir. Now, what to do? Now, compute WDV. Compute WDV. So, what is WDV? Do not see anywhere. See at me. What is WDV? WDV is actual cost minus depreciation actually allowed. Now, you think logically. Is there any depreciation allowed to you in the current year? Is there any depreciation allowed to you in the current year? And the answer is no. Why? Why there is no depreciation allowed in the current year? There is no depreciation allowed in the current year because, because, 
you already have a lot of expense of 120 rupees just go through this example once so just focus on one thing over here are you getting any deduction of depreciation in the current year no we are not claiming any deduction in the current year of depreciation actually why because you see common sense says what you already have a sales of 100 and you have expenses of 120 now 120 rupees expense is sufficient to make you put you in loss yeah the depreciation is not getting used in the current year the depreciation is intact it is in fact getting carried forward to the next year and next year it will be allowed as deduction that is the reason it is termed as what unabsorbed depreciation now listen carefully please all of you this depreciation is not allowed to you in the current year if it is not allowed to you in the current year what is the definition of wdv the definition of wdv is actual cost minus depreciation actually allowed is there any depreciation actually allowed to you in the current year no and therefore the wdv of the next year will be 100 rupees now if i apply this formula there is a problem in this formula why you think mathematically now you have to apply your mathematical mind you are showing your 100 rupees as sales listen carefully you are showing 120 rupees as expense okay you are showing 10 rupees as depreciation and you are showing 10 rupees depreciation is unabsorbed which i will carry forward and set off in future years okay that is all fine you can carry forward and set off this depreciation in future year so you will carry forward this set of a depreciation in future year and at the same time you think like this you say that this depreciation is not allowed in the current year therefore i cannot reduce from here and at the same time you will keep your wdb intact in the next year at 100 rupees so what will happen in the next year in the next year what will happen you will have double benefit how double benefit because from previous year you are carrying forward carrying forward 10 rupees and in the next year you are again depreciating at 100 rupees will this amount to dual benefit or not it will amount to dual benefit and because of this the government has brought a provision what is the provision that that depreciation deemed to be actually allowed means what that as per explanation 3 to 43 6 any uad carried forward under section 32 subsection 2 if you are carrying forward any uad under section 32 subsection 2 shall be deemed to be actually allowed in the current year you have to be deemed to be allowed in that in the current year so it means whatever is uad which is coming in in front of you over here that is deemed to be actually allowed it is not actually allowed but deemed to be actually allowed you have to reduce from the block and make it 90 rupees see the moral of the story is very simple i am trying to explain you the logic if you understand the logic well and good if you don't understand the logic the logic is not written anywhere it's not written in your study material your ultimate treatment will be what it's very easy anyways to understand the logic there is nothing great there is no rocket science in this it's a basic mathematical logic but ultimate treatment is what unabsorbed depreciation if there is unabsorbed depreciation in the current year is it allowed to you in the current year no 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 if it would have been allowed i would have not called that as unabsorbed na? it is definitely carried forward and it will be allowed in future year but you have to reduce from the block in the current year it is deemed to be actually allowed even though it is not allowed to you in the current year but it is deemed to be actually allowed in the current year so you have to reduce on the block of asset is it clear to all of you i hope it is clear to all of you so this is what this provision is all about this is the first exception so by default what the law says pay attention please by default the law says that you have to reduce what you have to reduce the depreciation actually allowed from the block of asset but unabsorbed depreciation is not actually allowed still you are reducing from the block of asset are you reducing or not yes we are unabsorbed depreciation is not actually allowed to you still you are reducing from the block of asset you are reducing from the block of asset and that is what the provision is all about this is the first exception okay now second exception to explain the second exception which starts from here and ends here it's a three line exception i have to explain you with the help of an example now pay attention please suppose there is an assessee engaged in growing and manufacturing tea in india so there is an assessee who is engaged in growing and manufacturing tea in india 
okay it's doing both the composite activity and the pgpp from the same is say 300 lakhs or yeah, 3000 lakhs less depreciation at the rate of 15 percent on rupees 1000 lakhs okay this is the cost of the asset this is the actual cost of the asset so this will come to 150 lakhs and therefore this will be how much this will be 2850 Okay, now what happens after this? What happens after this? You have to be understanding that very precisely. You would have done in CA enter also in agriculture income. If you are growing and manufacturing tea both, then this entire amount cannot be called as taxable. Only 40% is business income. You remember that? And 60% is agriculture. And if 40% is business income, then 2850. 40% of that comes to how much? 1140 is business income. And 1140 minus 2850, 1710 is what? Exempt. Is exempt income. Okay. You would have done that in CA inter. In CA final also we will be doing in the next topics. For tea, coffee, rubber, somewhere it is 40, 60, somewhere it is 25, 75, somewhere it is 35, 65, so on and so forth. Okay. But here 40, it is 40, 60, 40% 40 business, 60% agriculture. So, everything is fine till here. Now, we have to compute WDV. Now, what is WDV? WDV is actual cost of the asset minus depreciation actually allowed. Actually allowed means what? That depreciation which is saving your tax in the current year. Which is saving your tax in the current year. Okay. So, what the SSC is saying? What Asasi, what is the stand of Asasi? Asasi is saying that actual cost is 1000 lakhs, okay. Minus depreciation actually allowed is not 150 lakhs because out of this 150 lakhs, I am using only 40 percent to earn my taxable income and 60 percent is uh, used for earning exempt income. Listen carefully, Asasi is saying that whatever assets I am using. Out of that, 40% is used for taxable income and 60% is used for exempt income. So, my actually allowed depreciation is only 40% of this amount. The SSE is making that argument that my actually allowed depreciation is only 40% of this. So, 40% of this will come to 60 lakhs and the SSE is saying that my WDV for the next year is on a higher side that is 940 lakhs. This is the argument made by the SSE. This is the argument made by the SSC. What is the why SSC is not reducing 150 from here? Because SSC is saying that my entire asset is used partially for business, partially for exempt income. Therefore, the asset which is used for exempt income, that depreciation is not allowed to me because that is used to earn exempt income. In a, when an income is exempt, the question of deduction does not arise only. So, deduction is only with respect to 40 percent. So, I am getting deduction only with respect to 40 percent. So, I want to deduct from here only 40 percent of my depreciation. Okay. I will only reduce 40 percent of my depreciation from here. Okay. And after that, my answer will come to 940 lakhs. Okay. Now, listen carefully. So, the government came into picture and the government said that, Achha. We have made a provision now. In case the income is partially from agriculture, yes, it is partially from agriculture and partially from business, yes, it is partially from business. Then it is deemed that it is only from business. It is you deem that it is only business only and the entire depreciation is deemed to be allowed for the business. Entire depreciation is business only. One entire 150 lakhs, you assume that it is for business. In short, reduce entire depreciation from the block. In short, you have to reduce entire 150 lakhs from the block. So, now after the amendment, this amendment came long back in 2009. This stand of assessee will not work. Assessee, what he is supposed to do? 1000 lakh minus what? Assume that entire depreciation is coming from business 
and reduce the entire depreciation and show the WDV of the next year on a lower side. You cannot show on a higher side of 940 lakhs. Okay. So, these are the two exceptions. First exception, by default, WDV is actual cost minus depreciation actually allowed by default. Whatever is the actual cost, you reduce depreciation actually allowed. On. Actually allowed means that depreciation which is saving your tax in the current year. But there are two exceptions where it is not actually allowed to you. Still, you will reduce from the block of asset. First, unabsorbed depreciation is not allowed to you in the current year, but still it is deemed to be allowed. And here, the 60% agriculture income depreciation is not actually allowed to you, but you assume that entirely it is from business and reduce entirely from the block of asset. This is what this provision wants to tell you. Take a photograph of this. It is, this example will help you to build the concept in a better manner. Okay. So, when this provision comes with respect to tea, coffee or rubber, what you will do? While computing depreciation, you will not do anything. You will compute depreciation normally and you will reduce the entire depreciation from the block of asset. You will not segregate into 4060 for depreciation purpose at least. Is it clear? I hope it is clear to all of you. Now, one last thing I would like to say over here. I hope you have taken the photograph of this. And that is with respect to goodwill. With respect to goodwill, the government has made a very big amendment from 2020-21 onwards. So, from financial year 2020-21, deduction of depreciation on goodwill not allowed. It means what? It means if I purchase a new goodwill, in financial year 2021 and further, then no depreciation, okay. Depreciation will not be allowed to me, okay. Now, the question is what if I have purchased earlier? Suppose if I have purchased some goodwill in financial year 15-16, some goodwill was purchased for 10 lakh rupees. At that time, the depreciation was allowed. And that depreciation would definitely be forming part of my what? It will be definitely forming part of my WDV as on 1-4-2020. That is the first day of this year. Yes or no? Are, if I have purchased goodwill in earlier years, in 15-16 it was allowed. In 16-17 it was allowed. 17-18 it was allowed. 18-19 it was allowed. 19-20 also it was allowed. So, the government says what? In that case, you have to take this goodwill and you have to reduce the depreciation of all these th all these years and see what is the WDV on this year. Whatever is the WDV on this year, you have to reduce on the block of the intangible asset. We will not allow you depreciation on the old goodwill also. So, definitely if you purchase a new goodwill now, you will not get any deduction. But if there is an old goodwill in the intangible asset block, is it possible or not? In the intangible asset block, there is an old goodwill. So, you have to remove that goodwill, that much WDV of that goodwill in financial year 2021 from the WDV of the intangible asset. You have to remove that much from the intangible assets WDV. I hope it is clear to you. So, this is what it is written over here. If the value of the block of asset and 1 for 2020 includes goodwill of a business or profession on which depreciation was taken by SSC in any preceding year, then the depreciated value of goodwill shall be deducted from the value of the block of asset on 1st April 2020. So, whatever is the depreciated value, you have to reduce from the block on 1 for 2020, so that from 2020-21 onwards, you do not get depreciation on old goodwill also. You will not get on old goodwill also. Okay. So, now let us go ahead with the next part. The next part is what? Pay attention, please. The next part is an extension of what we have started today. What? What we have started today was WDV ka discussion. So, the next part is WDV is equal to actual cost minus depreciation actually allowed. So, the next part is what is actual cost then? What is the definition of actual cost then? If WDV is actual cost minus depreciation actually allowed, then what is the actual cost? And honestly speaking, in the first year, the concept of WDV does not arise only. The concept of WDV will come from second year onwards now because in first year, actual cost it is, it is, is itself relevant to claim depreciation. 
in the first year you are not interested in the WDV. The WDV will come into play from the second year onwards. Therefore, the bigger question is what is actual cost. So, let us start the discussion of what do you mean by the term actual cost now. What is actual cost? Is the word actual cost defined? Yes, it is defined in section 43.1. So, how is it defined? It is defined as follows. Actual cost means actual cost. The term actual cost means what? Actual cost of asset to the SSE as reduced by that portion which is met directly or indirectly by any person or authority. Now, what do I mean by this? It is a very strange, it is a very vague definition. When I ask you what is actual cost, you say actual cost means actual cost. Such a vague definition it is, such a strange definition. But the government has thought something before saying it. They are not just uh, putting the definition for the sake of putting it. There is some reason behind it. What is the reason? Why they have put such definition of actual cost? They could have easily said actual cost means price of the asset. No, no, no. They are not saying price. They are saying cost. The word cost is very wide as compared to the word price. If somebody asks me, what is the price of the TV which is hanging in your office? I will say it is 50,000 rupees. But if somebody asks me, what is the cost of this TV? I would say, wait. 50,000 rupees I paid for the TV. Then 5,000 rupees I paid for that stand. Then 2,000 rupees I paid for that electrician. Then 2,000 rupees I paid for that for the purpose of what? For the purpose of delivery charge of the TV. The total the actual cost of putting the TV into working condition is 50,000 plus some expenses more. Say 50,000 plus 5,000 plus 4,000 plus 2, whatever expenses. That is my actual cost. So, the word cost is very wider as compared to the word price. The word cost means all those costs which are necessary to put the asset into working condition. Whatever expenses you are incurring to put the asset into working condition will be part of what? Actual cost. Will be part of actual cost. Forget about this. Not only this. If you are taking, if you are taking a loan, what? If you are taking a loan, okay, on which you are paying interest. So, till the time the asset is not put to use. Till that time, you have to capitalize the interest also to the cost of asset. You would have done this in, in your what? In your accounts also, financial reporting. Say, for example, I have taken a loan in pre-commencement period. So whatever interest you are paying, you have to add to what? Cost of asset. Even Supreme Court of India says that in the case of Challapalli Sugar Mills Limited. Supreme Court has held that in this case. That whatever expenditure you incur in the form of interest, till the time the business is not started, you have to capitalize to the cost of asset. Okay. What after the business is started? After the business is started, then also, suppose if you have taken a loan of 10%, loan of 10 lakhs and you have purchased a fixed asset, you have taken a loan on 1st April 2022 and then you have purchased the fixed asset and you have put to use on 1st October 2022. So, this much period from year till year, whatever interest you have paid, you have to capitalize to the asset and you have to claim what? Depreciation on that much interest. Once you have put the asset into use, then you can claim the interest as what? As an expense. As which expense? As the revenue expense. But till the time the as asset is not put to use, you have to capitalize the interest to the cost of asset. Okay, you can see this, all these things are given over here. If his interest is incurred after commencement of production, then it shall also, it shall be allowed as a revenue expenses. In short, till the time the asset is not put to use, capitalize the interest expense. Once the asset is put to use, then claim as revenue expense. Therefore, the word actual cost means actual cost is a very wider term. 
Actual cost means actual cost. It means it shall include all those expenses which are necessary to put the asset into a working condition. Whatever expenses you incur to put the asset into working condition, that shall form part of actual cost. I hope it is clear to all of you, right? Now, at the same time, there is one more restriction. If you are purchasing an asset and if you are paying more than 10,000 rupees to any person, then you have, if you are purchasing an asset, suppose I am buying this mobile phone, this is an asset for me and I am paying more than 10,000 rupees to a person in a day, then I have to make the payment by four modes, either by account pay check, account pay draft, ECS, electronic clearing system or such other electronic mode as may be prescribed by the government. I will be speaking about these four modes later on, do not worry, in detail, I will be speaking about that. But right now also I am saying, if you are purchasing any asset and making a payment to a person, to a person in a day of more than 10,000 rupees, to a person in a day of more than 10,000 rupees, you have to make the payment by account pay check, account pay draft, ECH or such other electronic mode as may be prescribed. You have to make the payment by these four modes. What are these four modes? We will be talking about this sometime later, do not worry. Okay, It is written over here, but we will have great discussion on this after sometime when we are doing the disallowances under the head PGVP. Now, there is one small ICDS that also says the same thing. What I have said you, whatever expenses are related to fixed asset, you have to capitalize that. If they are not related to fixed asset, do not capitalize. Like example, admin and general overhead expenses are excluded from the cost if they do not relate to what? Specific tangible asset. If the expenses are not related to asset, do not include. If they are specifically attributable, then it should be included as a part of cost of asset and then you have to capitalize. Moral of the story is very simple. All expenses which are necessary to put the asset into working condition and which are related to asset, you have to capitalize. Expenditure incurred on startup commissioning of the project including expenditure on test run shall be capitalized. Expenditure incurred after, after the plant has begun production and production for sale or captive consumption shall be treated as revenue expenditure. So, whatever expenditure you incurred on test run, etc., to check whether the whether the machinery is working properly or not, whether the production is done properly or not. These are all pre-commencement activities. So, whatever expenditure you done on test run, etc., all of them have to be capitalized. Once the production is started, after that, if you are incurring an expenditure, then it will be a revenue expense. Then it should not be added to the cost of asset. Okay. Similarly, one more ICDS is there with respect to what? Borrowing cost, which I have just spoken to you. That if you take a loan for the purpose of an asset, so you might have heard one technical word in accounts. Till the time the asset is a qualifying asset, you can capitalize it. You would have done this word in your accounts, in financial reporting, in borrowing cost. So if you take a loan, if you borrow some money for a qualifying asset, so till the time the asset is a qualifying asset, you can capitalize that to what? To the cost of asset. Sir, what is a qualifying asset? Qualifying asset means what? Qualifying asset means the same definition of accounts. An asset which takes substantial period of time for it to be ready for its intended use. Any asset which takes substantial period of time for it to be ready for its intended use can be called as a qualifying asset. Now, suppose if I take a loan, listen carefully. If I take a loan, which is directly for qualifying asset, then there is no issue. Then whatever interest in expense will come, capitalize. Okay. But that is not always the case. Sometimes the loan is not directly taken for a qualifying asset, but it is what? A general loan. Which is used for qualifying assets also and it is used for other purpose also. Then what to do? Then there is a formula which is given by the government. That much you have to what? Capitalize. See, there can be two types of loan. One which you have taken specifically for what? Capitalized asset, for, for qualifying asset. The loan which is specifically taken for qualifying asset, close your eyes and capitalize that much interest. But loan which is generally taken, some portion might go for capitalized, uh, for qualified assets, some portion might go for fixed assets, other fixed assets, some portion might go for stock, some portion is there in bank account, some is there in cash, some is there in investments. Then how to do that? Let's see. There is a formula which is given by the government in this ICDS. If the funds are borrowed, left hand side, 
specifically for qualifying asset. There is no issue only over here. When you know that this fund is for qualifying asset only, then close your eyes and you must capitalize. But the funds are generally borrowed for qualifying asset, not specifically. Then you have to capitalize in accordance with this formula A into B divided by C. Now you will ask what is A, what is B, what is C? What is A, sir? A is the interest amount. Which interest? The loan which is directly attributable to qualifying asset? No, no, no. General loan. Interest on general loan. A is borrowing cost incurred during the previous year except borrowing directly relatable to specific purpose. It means which borrowing? General borrowing. This talks about which borrowing? This talks about general borrowing. So, whatever is the general borrowing, you have to do what? You have to take it in point number A. Whatever is the specific borrowing, that is already capitalized over here. Okay. Now, we are interested in A into B divided by C. Now, what is B? What is B? B has three points. Wherever you fall, you have to take accordingly. Okay. Average of qualifying asset. Or in the balance sheet as on the first day and the last day of the previous year. So, whatever is the first day, 1st April 2022, take the value of qualifying asset. 31st March 2023, take the value of qualifying asset. Take the average. That is the point number B. What is point number C then? Point number C is nothing but the average of balance sheet total. Check. So, it is a very simple and common sense provision. How it is a common sense provision? Let me show you. This is the balance sheet. This is last year, this is current year. This is last year, this is current year. Okay. This is 10% loan. This is qualifying asset. You have to take this plus this divide by 2. This will be your numerator. And then total this plus this divide by 2. This will be your denominator. And your interest of the current year will become point number A. Okay. But in point number B, there are multiple options which are possible in point number B. In case the qualifying asset does not appear in the balance sheet on the first day, it may be possible. On first day, qualifying asset was not there. It started from June. On first April, it was not there. In case the qualifying asset does not appear in balance sheet in the first day or both. Both means not on the first day also, not on the last day also. So, it may be possible that qualifying asset was not there on first day. It may be possible it was not there on first day also and last day also. It started in June and completed in December. Then what to do? Then take half of the qualifying asset. Then whatever is the cost of the qualifying asset, take half of that as point number B. That's it. So, if the qualifying asset is not there on the first day or if it is not there on the first day as well as last day, started in June, completed in December, then whatever is the cost of the qualifying asset, divide by 2, take half. Okay. Point number three, the third possibility. In case the qualifying asset does not appear in the balance sheet on the last day, it means it appears on the first day. It means it was there in the first day, but it was not there in the last day because in, in the meanwhile, in the meanwhile, in during the year itself, the qualifying asset is no more qualifying now. It is ready for its use now. So, on the first day, it was there, but on the last day, it was not there. Then what to do? Then take the average of the cost on the first day and the date of put to use. On the first day, it is there now. Take that value. And the date of put to use, whatever the value was, take that value, take the average of that. Okay. So, there are three possibilities. In first possibility, opening balance also there, closing also there. In second possibility, opening is not there. Or opening, closing, both are not there. In third possibility, opening is there, closing is not there. Okay. This is B. B In B, there are three possibilities. Once that is done, you have to divide by C. C is common for everyone. Divide by C is what? Total of average, total of assets. Opening balance of asset, closing balance of total assets, divide by 2. And last but not least, once the asset is put to use, it shall be considered as a revenue expenditure and it shall be allowed as deduction under section 36, subsection 1, clause 3. Capitalization is only possible till the time the asset is not used. Capitalization is only possible till the asset is, till the time the asset is what? Is a qualifying asset. Okay. Just go through it once and then we will go ahead. So, now let us go ahead after we are done with what is actual cost and we have seen cert certain issues with respect to what uh, certain ICDS. Now, there, there are around 13 explanations. Pay attention please. Now, this is very interesting and very important for us in exams. 
below the definition of actual cost, this is the definition of actual cost, which is given under 43.1, there are around 13 explanations below it. Now, what are these explanations all about? These explanations talks about actual cost in certain special cases. So, they define actual cost in certain special cases. By default, what is an actual cost? Actual cost means an actual cost. But in these 13 cases, actual cost is not actual, but it is something else. So, in these 13 cases, actual cost does not remain actual. In fact, it is something else only. So, we need to identify those 13 cases and we need to also identify in those 13 cases individually what is the actual cost. Now, some of the some of the cases we are not going to do it today because some of them are related to some other topics like many of them are related to the chapter of capital gains and some of them are related to the PGVP subsequent provisions which we are going to do in subsequent lectures but don't worry <laughs> when the syllabus will be ended you can make a note right now itself if you want if you don't trust me you can make a note right now that at the end of the syllabus, all 13 explanations will be done with you all. Okay, don't worry about it. So, let us start with the first one. The first one is the explanation number 2 which we are starting. Okay, we are keeping this on hold. We are keeping this on hold. We will be doing these things with capital gains because this is based on capital set, capital gains. This is based on scientific research. Which we will be doing when we will be doing scientific research section. Right now, I am not interested. Right now, I am interested in only what? Those are purely PGVP provisions, which are based on depreciation. The first explanation which we are starting today is this. Asset acquired by way of gift. If somebody is giving you an asset by way of gift or somebody is giving you an asset by way of inheritance. Or you can write one more thing. Somebody is giving you a gift by way of will. So, if somebody is giving you an asset by way of gift, will or inheritance, then what will be your actual cost? In that case, the actual cost will be the actual cost to the previous owner minus the depreciation which is allowed to that person. So, suppose the previous owner has purchased the asset for 1 lakh rupees minus whatever is the depreciation allowed to that person till last year. Don't take the current year. Till last year. Because in the year of transfer under income tax law, depreciation is not allowed. So, if I am transferring, if the if, if somebody is transferring the, me the asset in 20 to 23, you have to reduce depreciation till 21, 22 and see what is the WDV. That will become the actual cost in your hand. See here. So, if the asset is received by way of gift or will or inheritance, your actual cost will be actual cost to the previous owner minus depreciation actually allowed to that person. So, 1 lakh for example minus, suppose if he has used the asset for 4 years, reduce the depreciation of 4 years, excluding the current year in which the asset is transferred. Okay, I hope it is clear. It is a very simple explanation. <laughs> Coming to the explanation 3. Now, this is very important for us. This is also very important for us. These two explanations are extremely important for us in exams. So, be very careful about it. Okay, so, let me talk about these two explanations one by one. First explanation 3. Explanation 3, I will explain you with the help of an example. Suppose there are two persons. Pay attention please. Why explanation 3 was introduced? That is what I am trying to explain you. There is one person, Mr. A. There is another person, Mr. B. Both are friends. Mr. A is a seller. Mr. B is a buyer. Now, both are entering into an arrangement. Mr. A has an AC. The WDV of the AC is say for example 20,000 rupees. Okay. Just 20,000 is the WDV of the AC. Now Mr. A is selling that AC to Mr. B at a very high price. At a very high price say of 5 lakh rupees. Therefore, this being a part of block of asset. Mr. A has to compute capital gain, selling price 5 lakhs minus WDV. In case of block of asset, capital gains is computed like this. You, have, you would have done in CA enter also. If you have not done, we will do in CA final. Don't worry. So, you have to compare with what? WDV, not cost. In case of block of asset, you compare selling price with WDV, not cost. So this is 20K and therefore, there is a 4.8 lakhs. What? 
short term capital gains now mr a is very smart he is deliberately selling at a very high price because he has a short term capital loss kept with him of 10 lakh rupees and what he will do he will set off this loss with this particular income and his capital gains will become zero and he will not be liable to pay any tax so what is the advantage in this transaction the advantage is in this transaction is to mr b what advantage mr b will get higher cost higher cost means higher depreciation he will get that means lower profits that means lower tax are you able to understand for example this jacket is an asset and if i sell this jacket at a very high price and there is a capital gains okay or for example forget about jacket this phone is an asset and if i sell this asset sell this phone for a very high price okay there will be a capital gains in the hands of the seller no doubt but i have lot of capital loss with me so i will set off so no tax implication in my hands but my friend will get what higher cost he will get higher cost i will get higher depreciation lower profit lower tax so the government said that if we find anyone buying a set at a higher cost then the assessing officer will take an approval from joint commissioner and they will determine the cost of the asset check asset acquired at a higher price yes mr v is acquiring asset at a very high price from any other person using the asset for his business or profession with a view to claim depreciation on enhanced cost and reduced tax liability yes i am buying an asset at a very high cost with a view to claim more depreciation and enhanced depreciation with an intention of reducing tax liability yes in that case the actual cost will be determined by ao with the prior approval of joint commissioner ao will determine the actual cost with the prior approval of what joint commissioner check so the moment the ao comes to know that you are buying asset at a very high price he will tell that i will up, i will compute the what i will ask the joint commissioner about it i'll take an approval from joint commissioner and accordingly i will determine your actual cost check <laughs> this is what this provision has to say beautiful provision you want if you want to take a photograph of this you can take this for your better understanding okay so let's go ahead with the next explanation pay attention and please what is the next explanation suppose this is financial year 15 16 suppose and there is mr a over here who has bought an asset for 1 lakh rupees now after 2 years in financial year 17 18 mr a has sold this asset to mr b then mr b has sold this asset to mr c and then in 22 23 you are mr a is again buying that same asset from mr c for how much for 3 lakh rupees so asset once belonged to mr a then sold to mr b then mr b sold to mr c then again the same asset is bought from mr c by mr a in 2022-23 for a very higher price so in that case the government says that we do, will not give you the actual cost as 3 lakh rupees this 3 lakh rupees has to be compared with something else with which amount it has to be compared let's see asset once belong to the assessee which was used by him for business yes once the asset was belonging to mr a it was used by me then i transferred yes then i transferred and then i reacquired then i reacquired yes then i reacquired that then the wdv at the time of original transfer original transfer means what wdv at the time of original transfer means when mr a sold to mr b at that time what was the wdv that is 1 lakh minus depreciation of 15 16 minus depreciation of 16 17 wdv at that time you have to compare with that what the wdv at the time of original transfer when the first transfer was made at that time what was the wdv or the price paid for reacquiring the asset that is 3 lakh rupees when you reacquire the asset what was the price whichever is earlier whichever is lesser will be considered as your what as your actual cost so here you are doing what you are making a loop by selling it to multiple person and then reacquiring that with an intention of increasing what the cost 
So you will not get the actual cost as actual cost. The actual cost will be reacquisition price or WDV at the time of original transfer, whichever is less. That will be allowed as actual cost. I hope it is clear to all of you. Yes, I hope it is. Let's move on to the next one. Explanation 4A. Now, what is this explanation all about? Let me give you an example of this one also. Pay attention, please. There is Mr. A over here. There is Mr. B over here. Now, Mr. B has purchased an asset of 1 lakh rupees. And he is claiming depreciation also. Say 30,000 he has claimed depreciation. 70,000 is the WDV. Okay. Mr. B has purchased an asset for 1 lakh. He has claimed depreciation of 30,000 for last few years. 70,000 is his WDV. Now, what am I doing? I am acquiring the asset from him. After acquiring the asset, what I am doing? I am leasing back to him. Then in that case, suppose I acquired the asset for rupees 2 lakhs and then I leased back to Mr. B itself. Then in that case, what will be the actual cost in my hands? What will be the actual cost in my hands? What will be the actual cost? Technically speaking, it has to be 2 lakhs, but the government says no. In this case, the actual cost will not be 2 lakhs. Now, you have to substitute the name over here with me. Asset acquired by an SSE, that is Mr. B. From another person, that is Mr. A. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Asset acquired by an SSE, that is Mr. A. From another person, that is Mr. B. We are acquiring from Mr. B, right? We are acquiring from Mr. B. Who had claimed depreciation? Yes, Mr. A had, Mr. B had claimed depreciation on such asset. An asset is leased back to such other person. Yes, it is leased back to Mr. B. Then in that case, when you are acquiring the asset, what is the actual cost in your hands? The actual cost will be the WDV of the asset to the transferer. Who is the transferer? Mr. B is the transferer. So, whatever is the WDV of the asset in the hands of the transferer, that will become the actual cost in your hands. So, in that case, what is the WDV? 70,000 rupees is the WDV. So, in this case, the actual cost will remain how much? Will remain 70,000. This is what explanation 4A to section 43.1 has to say. Just take a photograph of this. That asset once belonged to somebody else. That person is claiming depreciation. Then I am acquiring. Then I am leasing back the same asset to the same person. In that case, when I am acquiring the asset, the WDV of the asset in the hands of the transferer will become my actual cost. Check. So the four explanations which we have seen so far, I will tell you. First, you are actually receiving somebody, some asset from someone in the form of gift or in the form of will or inheritance. Then what is your actual cost? Actual cost in the hands of the previous owner minus depreciation allowed to that person. Huh. In all the cases, you will take depreciation till last year. Huh? Don't take the depreciation of the current year because in the year of transfer in income tax, you do not get depreciation. I will be speaking about that in, in some time again. Second, when somebody is selling the asset at a very high price, then in that case, the actual cost in the hands of the recipient will be the determined by AO with the approval of joint company. Then if I am selling asset to Mr. B, Mr. B is selling to Mr. C, Mr. C is selling to again me, then in my case, the actual cost will be when I was selling the asset for the first time, what was the WDV at that time compared with reacquisition price, whichever is less. And the fourth one is this one, which you can see on the board. Okay. Now, next one, pay attention to this. Suppose if there is a personal plant, machinery, or furniture, personal, this phone is personal. Okay. Television is personal. Refrigerator is personal, for example, which I am using for my personal use, for example. Now, I am bringing this into business then what will be the actual cost? So the government says that in that case, suppose I purchase this phone for 50,000 rupees, mobile phone. Now after some time, I am converting that into what? A business phone. Then what will be the actual cost? There is no explanation for such things. And if there is no explanation for such things, the actual cost will remain actual cost and it will be 50,000. 
be very careful be very careful if you take your furniture from your house to your office the actual cost will remain actual cost if you take your television from your house to your office your actual cost will remain actual cost if you take your tv from your house to your office actual cost will remain actual cost if you take your microwave from your house to your office your actual cost will remain actual cost because there is no explanation for plant machinery furniture converting from personal use to business use there is no explanation nothing like that is there okay but what if i convert my personal building suppose i purchased a building in 2015 16 for personal use and 2022 23 i am converting that into a business use then what will happen then what will happen then also actual cost will remain actual cost no 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 now there is a specific explanation given by government for building for building the government has given a specific explanation for plant machinery and furniture actual cost will remain actual cost be very careful so for building there is a different treatment for rest of the asset there is a different treatment sir what is the treatment for building let's read together building use for private purpose okay and subsequently brought into business use what will be the actual cost the cost of purchase or construction of the building as reduced by notional depreciation calculated at the rate of depreciation applicable to the year of conversion in the business use so what are you supposed to do in this case nothing nothing great as such just see at what price you have purchased the building in 2015 16 suppose i have purchased the building for 1 crore rupees then you have to reduce the depreciation for 15 16 16 17 17 18 18 19 19 20 20 20 20 21 till 20 21 don't reduce for 22 23 because that is the year in which you are converting so reduce the notional depreciation for this year notional depreciation because depreciation is notional because you are using it for personal purpose it cannot be called as actual reduce notional depreciation then whatever amount will left that wdv will become actual cost in 2022 20 23 sir what will be the rate of depreciation the rate of depreciation for all these years will be of 2022 to 23 only so for all the years you are supposed to take the current rate whatever is the current rate running right now in the financial year 22 23 you are supposed to consider that rate over here check over here please the cost of purchase or construction of the building as reduced by the notional depreciation calculate at the depreciation rate applicable to the year of conversion so year of conversion is 20 to 23 whatever is the rate applicable in the current year you are supposed to take that rate okay i hope it is clear to all of you right so this is what this explanation is all about for building there is an explanation for plant machinery and furniture there is no explanation unfortunately or fortunately whichever way you take and for plant machinery and furniture actual cost will remain actual cost always okay so let's go ahead there are some explanations which are missing in between we'll be doing that don't worry explanation 6 7 etc coming to explanation 8 which i have already told you how i'll again tell you if you want once the asset is put to use okay you have taken a loan for buying an asset so till the time the asset is not put to use what do you do with the interest cost till the time the asset is not put to use you capitalize the interest cost to the cost of asset but once the asset is put to use what will you do with that interest cost that interest cost will go to pnl account right that will not form part of actual cost of the asset because once the asset is put to use the interest will now go to what pnl account this is what this explanation wants to tell you asset acquired out of borrowed funds okay you are borrowing funds and then you are acquiring an asset interest on loan borrowed relating to period after the asset is first put to use shall never form part of actual cost once the asset is put to use after that whatever is the interest cost that shall never form part of what actual cost it will never be part of what actual cost is it clear it will be going directly to the pnl account and you can claim that as what as an expense okay now next explanation 9 is a very simple one nothing great as such let me explain you with the help of example explanation 9 pay attention on the board please all of you what is explanation 9 pay attention suppose i purchased a machinery of 10 lakh rupees now obviously on this 10 lakh rupees machinery in most of the cases i would have paid some gst say 12% 18% 5% whatever it is so say i have paid 12% gst on it so this machinery is now worth rupees 11 lakh 20000 rupees to me okay 
Now, what the government says that if you have claimed a credit of GST on this, if you have claimed GST credit on this amount, which you are eligible to, then you cannot claim depreciation on this amount. You have to claim depreciation on this amount. You cannot take both the benefits. So, if you are purchasing something and you are claiming GST credit on that, input tax credit on that as per the GST laws, then in that case, you cannot claim depreciation on that much portion. On that much portion, depreciation is not allowed. So, in this case, this is what this explanation has to say. So, Assessi has two options. Which two options? Option 1, claim GST on how much? 1.2 lakhs, then no depreciation. On what? On 1.2 lakhs. Ha, you, you can claim depreciation on 10 lakhs. No issue. Option 2. No GST. Then claim depreciation on entire what? 11.2 lakhs. Both the options are there. Whatever you want to take, you can take. Okay. So, there is nothing great in this explanation as such. Not important for exam very much. Asset acquired subject to the levy of GST in respect of which input credit is availed. So much of the GST or duty in respect of which a claim of credit has been made and allowed shall not form part of what? Actual cost. It shall not form part of actual cost. Government will not allow you that as a part of what actual cost. Okay. Okay, fine. So, if you are claiming a GST credit on a particular item, then that such amount will not be eligible for what? As a deduction for depreciation. Is it clear? I hope it is clear to all of you. Okay. So, there has been a power cut at my place. So, suddenly the lecture got stopped in between. So, I thought of going and getting the makeover done. So, finally I got some time to do the makeover. My family was also shouting at me since last so many days that go and cut your hair. Go and trim your beard. So, I said now I will go today because the electricity is not there. Anyways, let us go ahead with the discussion. This is what we have been doing. Explanation 9, which we have done earlier before the makeover. Now, after makeover, let us go ahead with something big, something important. Explanation 10, extremely important and it is a long discussion now, which will go on for around half an hour at least. So, pay absolute attention now on explanation 10. Explanation 10, what does it say? It says that if you are buying an asset, suppose if you are buying an asset, the cost of the asset is say 100 rupees. And if somebody is giving some subsidy, grant or reimbursement for the same, it means in some or the other way somebody is helping you. Suppose if somebody is helping you to the extent of 20 crore rupees, then that much has to be reduced from the actual cost. Because that much amount you have not paid from your pocket and therefore your actual cost will be how much? 80 crore rupees. Okay. So if somebody is helping you to buy an asset in the form of a subsidy grant or reimbursement that that much amount should be reduced from the actual cost it is as simple as this now let me give you one more example suppose there is government over here okay and there is assessee over here and the assessee is starting with a new project of say 120 crore rupees in this project there will be some plant and machinery there will be some furniture there will be some building. It is a project which has many assets. So, the plant and machinery is say 50 crores, furniture is say 20 crores and building is also say 50 crores. Okay. Now, the government is not financing an asset but they are financing you lot of assets. This is singular. This is plural. The government is now financing lot of assets and the government is saying that we will finance you 20% of the project. So, 20% of the project will come to 120 crore, 20%, 24 crore. So the government is saying that we will finance you how much? 20%. That is 24 crore we will finance. Out of 120 crore, 20 crore we will finance. Now, what SSC is doing? Assessi is trying to play very smart and he is trying to reduce this from year and year and he is not reducing this from year. Why? 
what can be the possible logic? The logic is very simple. That reducing this 24 crore from year and year will be beneficial for the assessee because furniture is depreciated at 10 percent, building is depreciated at 10 percent, but plant and machinery is depreciated at 15 percent. So, the assessee is thinking why to unnecessarily reduce that asset who is depreciated at higher percentage? Plant and machinery is depreciated at 15 percent. So, we will not touch that now. We will touch what furniture? We will reduce furniture. The loss will be lesser. We will reduce what? We will reduce building. The loss will be lesser. And therefore, the assessee is doing what? The assessee is reducing this 24 crore from year and year. So, the government said no. It is not allowed to be reduced like this. You have to reduce proportionately from all three of them. Proportionately means from this you have to reduce 20 percent, that is 10 crore, you have to reduce from this. From this you have to reduce 20 percent, that is 4 crore, you will reduce from this and then 10 crore you will reduce from this and this is how you will reduce your 24 crore rupees. Okay. So, if the finance is, if the subsidy grant and reimbursement is for a single asset, then reduce from that asset. But if it is for all the assets, it is for plural, lot of assets, then you have to reduce proportionately from all the assets. You can take a photograph of this if you want. Okay. Now, I will read the provision for you all. A portion of the cost of asset acquired is met directly or indirectly by government or any authority or any person in the form of subsidy, grant or reimbursement. Underline the words subsidy, grant and reimbursement. These are the three important words which we have to underline and keep it in our mind. Now, the first part is this, the second part is this. So much of the cost of asset as is relatable to such subsidy, grant or reimbursement shall not form part of actual cost. So, you should reduce that much from actual cost. If the subsidy is not directly relatable to an asset, but it is subsidies with reference to assets. Assets means plural. It is in relation to lot of assets. Then reduce proportionately. Proportionately reduce from the actual cost of the assets with reference to the subsidy which has been granted. Okay. So, you have to reduce proportionately. Now, after this explanation came, there was some doubt in the minds of us. Now, let me tell you what was the doubt. Pay attention please all of you. Then you also try to answer that particular thing to me. Okay. Pay attention on the board. Pay attention. Suppose there is an assessee over here. And there is a government over here. Now, this assessee has taken a loan. For fixed assets. From government. And this is the balance sheet of the assessee. Loan. 5000 crore and they have purchased fixed asset out of this loan of 8000 crore. 3000 crore they have put from their pocket. Now, after some time, there was huge loss to the SSE in the business of the SSE. So, SSE went to the government and the government, SSE went to the government for waiver of loan. And the government fortunately waived it. They waived this 5000 crore. Okay. Now, because the government has waived this loan, listen carefully now, please all of you. You have to think and answer now. And the government has waived this loan. They have waived it. They have said that we will not take this money from you. This money is given to you forever. Now, is this a benefit or not? Yes, it is a benefit. Now, Will this 5000 crore be reduced from this as per explanation 10? You have to answer this first of all. Will this 5000 crore be reduced from this 8000 crore as per explanation 10? And the answer is no. This waiver cannot be reduced from what? This waiver cannot be reduced from what? It cannot be reduced from your actual cost. Why? Because this waiver is neither subsidy nor grant re nor reimbursement. If you get subsidy or grant or reimbursement in respect of a fixed asset, then that has to be reduced from the block of asset and not waiver. So, what will happen with this? Nothing. So the government saw that nothing is getting happened with this. How can we leave something like this? So, in Finance Act 2015, what they did? They amended the definition of income 
This is where the income is defined under income tax law in section 2 clause 24. They inserted this new clause in the definition of income and widened the scope of taxability. How? Let's see. Just have patience. It's, it has a lot of things. I have to say a lot of things in this please. Pay attention please. Definition of income includes assistance in the form of what? Subsidy is income. Income. If it is income means you have to add to income and pay tax. Okay. Subsidy is income. Grant is income, cash incentive is income, duty drawback is income, waiver is income, concession is income, see waiver is income now, income now, concession is income, reimbursement is income by whatever name called, all these things are what, income, after finance act 2015, they have amended this provision in finance act 2015, now all of them are income, when they are income, if it is given by, if it is given by central government, if these things are given by central government, then it is income. If these things are given by state government, then it is income. If these things are given by any authority like local authority, municipality, gram panchayat, these are authorities, then it is income. If these things are given by statutory bodies like RBI, etc., these, then it is income. If these things are given by any statutory agencies, then it is income. So, if you have a close eye on these people, these are all governmental people. So, these are income. Listen carefully, it is not that simple. Please pay attention. These are income, provided it is given by these people. And if these people are giving you these things, then it is income. If it is income, add to income statement. So, now people started having one doubt. What doubt? If I get a subsidy, if I get, listen carefully, if I get a subsidy, see what I am highlighting, from central government for buying a fixed asset, then what shall I do? Shall I treat that as income or shall I do the treatment as per explanation 10? What shall I do then? Because as per explanation 10, that much subsidy has to be reduced from the cost of asset, but as per this definition. You have to treat that as income. What shall I do then? There is a clash of interest between two provisions. Explanation 10 says what? If you get any subsidy with respect to an asset, you have to reduce from cost and here it is written. If a subsidy is received from central government, then you have to do what? Treat it as income. Then what shall I do? You follow this. Don't follow this. Why? Because this particular thing is excluded from the definition of income. Check. It means for asset, whatever you used to do earlier, you have to do the same thing now also. Because that is excluded from the definition of income. Check please. Check please. Because it is written other than subsidy or grant or reimbursement referred to in explanation 10. And in explanation 10, which subsidy, grant and reimbursement is referred? Which is in reference to what? Fixed asset. It means if the subsidy or grant or reimbursement is with respect to fixed asset, then you will do what? You will reduce it from the cost of asset. Don't treat it as income. But if the subsidy grant and reimbursement is not with respect to fixed asset, the subsidy is some, some other subsidy like say government is giving you subsidy for electricity bill. Then it is income because that is not for fixed asset. Suppose if the government is giving you subsidy for say buying raw material, then it is income because that is not for fixed asset. I hope it is clear to all of you. Therefore, if the subsidy, grant or reimbursement is for fixed asset, go to explanation 10, reduce from the block of asset. But if the subsidy, grant and reimbursement is for what? Not fixed asset. Is for expenses, then income. What about waiver? Waiver will always come over here. Because waiver cannot get, go over there. Because in explanation 10, waiver is not written. Yes or no? Waiver will always come under income only. So, in this example which I have written on the board, this 5000 crore rupees which is waived by government, this will be income because that cannot be covered in explanation 10. In explanation 10, only subsidy grant and reimbursement is covered. I hope it is clear to all of you. Okay. So, from the definition of income, they have excluded what? They have excluded explanation 10 fixed asset, subsidy grant reimbursement. The second thing which they have excluded from the definition which they do not intend to take tax on, that is if the central government, if the central government 
इज गिविंग सम सब्सिडी और ग्रांट टू द सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट ट्रस्ट और स्टेट गवर्नमेंट ट्रस्ट तो इफ द गिवर इज सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट एंड द रिसीवर इज सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट ट्रस्ट और स्टेट गवर्नमेंट ट्रस्ट सो द गिवर इज हो सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट एंड द रिसीवर इज सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट और स्टेट गवर्नमेंट ट्रस्ट देन नो इनकम टैक्स तो आई एम सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट आई एम गिविंग सम सब्सिडी टू माय स्टेट गवर्नमेंट टू माय सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट ट्रस्ट और आई एम गिविंग सम सब्सिडी टू माय स्टेट गवर्नमेंट ट्रस्ट देन इट इज नॉट टैक्सेबल सर व्हाट इफ आई सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट गिव सम सब्सिडी टू लोकल अथॉरिटी देन इट इज टैक्सेबल बिकॉज द गिवर इज सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट एंड द रिसीवर हैज टू बी सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट और स्टेट गवर्नमेंट ट्रस्ट नॉट लोकल अथॉरिटी नॉट लोकल अथॉरिटी देन इट इज टैक्सेबल ओके so this is also excluded from the definition of income the first thing which is excluded why because it is already covered in explanation 10 the second thing is excluded why because it is given by government to government only doesn't make sense to take tax on that the third thing lpg subsidy do, do you know once upon a time the government used to give lpg subsidy on cylinders now they don't give that so will that be taxable sir that will also be taxed no 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 government has clarified that lpg subsidy and other subsidies which are for the benefits of the individuals are not taxable likes for example if the government is giving some subsidy to some children's for education government is giving some subsidy to some students for further education all of them are not taxable don't worry about it check check okay now you have to be very careful with one thing now stay wait 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 the things are not yet done there are lot of small small things that i have to speak here pay attention please shall i say <laughs> yes so if there is a subsidy grant or reimbursement with reference to fixed asset then where you will go you will go to explanation tab if there is a waiver then you will come to income then you will come to income income definitely if there is a duty drawback come here concession come here reimbursement then you go over there because it is specifically covered with reference to fixed assets other things other than fixed assets it will come here now i would like to ask you one very simple question you have to think and answer look at the book and answer ah suppose i have taken a loan for what fixed asset from icici bank okay of 1000 crore now that loan is waived by icici bank waived ऐसे ऐसे वेब डाल लो फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन विल इट कम यर लोन टेकन फ्रॉम आईसीआईसीआई बैंक वेब बाय आईसीआईसीआई बैंक विल इट कम यर द आंसर इज नो बिकॉज वेवर इज नॉट कवर्ड यर सेकेंड थिंग विल इट कम यर कैन इट बी कॉल्ड एज इनकम बिकॉज वेवर इज कवर्ड यर द आंसर इज नो वाई नो डोंट जस्ट सी वेदर वेवर इज कवर्ड और नॉट ऑल्सो सी हु इज वेविंग it has to be waived by central government state government body agency authority not icici bank so if an icici bank waives your fixed asset loan it can neither be covered in explanation 10 nor covered year it has no treatment no tax nothing will be taxed be very careful so this is the ultimate conclusion of this entire discussion which we have done point number 1 if the subsidy is for acquiring fixed asset if it is for what acquiring fixed asset then without any second thought reduce from what actual cost as per explanation 10 any other subsidy etc will become taxable under pgbp or of ifos if it is received from central government state government authority body agency so if it is received from these people then it will be income if it is received from any other person then it is not income therefore if a waiver is done by a company then it shall not be taxable and it is a capital receipt it will not be taxable in that case it will become a capital receipt in your hand be very careful about it okay now there is one icds based on government grant over here let's understand that icds now so there are two parts in this icds the first part of this icds is the timing timing means when to recognize the government grant and the second part is how how means treatment and in fact the third part is if we have to give refund in case of refund what has to be the treatment so we have to learn all these three things over here one by one okay so this is icds 7 based on government grant 
let us try to understand this ICDS now one by one. First of all, we will try to understand the timing of recognition of government grant. When should I recognize government grant? Government grant are available to any person subject to lot of conditions. No government is going to give you grant without condition. They will attach lot of conditions to it. So, you have to fulfill the conditions. Then only grant is eligible to you. So, if the government is giving you some grant, which are subject to conditions, which is definitely subject to condition in most of the cases. So, the government says that you should not recognize the grant until there is a reasonable assurance, until you are 100% sure that you will comply with the conditions attached. So, if you are 100% sure that you will comply with the conditions attached, then you can what? Recognize the government grant. But if you are not sure, if you are not sure, then you cannot recognize. So, for that, suppose the government has given you 10 conditions, subject to which you will be getting the grant and the government has given you 100 crore. Now, you know that, yes, you will easily fulfill all the conditions, then recognize. But if you feel that, no, no, the conditions are very dangerous, it may or may not be fulfilled, then you may not recognize. Secondly, unless or until you are sure that, second condition, that the grant shall be received. So, you should be confident about the government with whom you are going to get the grant. You should be very sure that the government who is going to give you grant will give you the grant definitely. In case they do not give you then, the government does not have a good record. The past record is very bad of the government who is going to give you the grant. In that case, what will happen? In that case, the government says that the government grant should not be recognized. So, there are two conditions which you have to fulfill. This conditions you have to fulfill. This is something which is your obligation. And this is something which is government's obligation. So, if you are sure that you will fulfill the condition, secondly, if you are sure that the government will give you the grant, then you recognize or else do not recognize. If you are sure that, if you are sure that you are not going to fulfill the condition, then do not recognize. If you are sure that government is not going to give you the grant, the government has the past record of not giving the grant on time, then do not recognize. Secondly, once you have received the grant, then there is no question of postponing. Once you have received it, then you have to recognize the grant and you have to pay tax on that. So, the timing is very important when to recognize. You should not recognize unless and until there is a reasonable assurance that you will fulfill the conditions and there is a reasonable assurance that you will receive the grant. Once you receive it, then you have to recognize. Now, coming to the treatment. What is the treatment? The treatment differs depending upon the nature of grant. Suppose, if the grant is for depreciable asset, depreciable asset. So, this first one and the third one is for depreciable asset. So, what we do for depreciable asset? The same way we are supposed to do over here. The ICDS cannot tell you a different treatment as compared to what the income tax law says. The ICDS has to give you the same treatment the way it is given under the income tax law. So, what do you do for depreciable asset where the government grant relates to depreciable asset? Then deduct from actual cost. Deduct from what? Actual cost. Where government grant cannot be directly attributed to their asset. If a grant is not for asset, but it is for group of assets, plural, 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 then deduct proportionately from actual cost. You have to deduct from all the assets proportionately. So, if the government grant relates to a depreciable asset, if it relates to what? A depreciable asset, single asset, then reduce from the asset. If it is for lot of assets, as we have seen here, we have, we have written, we have noted down the example also, then you have to reduce proportionately from all the assets. Okay? Third, if the government grant is a compensation, there is some loss which has occurred to the SSC because of the government. There was riots in the state and because of that, there is a loss to my factory. There was flood in the state. There was earthquake in the state. So, government is giving me compensation. So, when is that compensation taxable? When it is receivable. Whenever it is receivable, when the government gives you a confirmation that we are going to give you this much amount, at that time, you are supposed to recognize that and pay tax. What about other, other than these cases? Second one, I will speak about in a while. What about other than these cases? Other than these cases, you have to follow the matching concept which you follow in accounts. You have to follow accounting treatments. Whatever you follow in accounts, you have to follow that. Now, let me speak about the first and the third one once again. Suppose the cost of the asset is 100 rupees. 
and the government is giving me grant of how much 20 rupees then I have to reduce that and that will become 80 crore will be my actual cost. Now this 20 crore is subject to what is subject to conditions this 20 crore is subject to conditions in case I do not fulfill that condition in case I do not fulfill that condition then I have to give this 20 crore refund back to the government yes you are supposed to give this 20 crore back to the government as refund then in that case what will be the treatment the treatment will be reversed what will you do just check here refund in case of depreciable asset you should increase the actual cost or WDB of the block so when you receive the grant you have reduced from the actual cost so when you refund the grant when you refund the grant you have to add it back to the block of asset it is as simple as that it, the treatment is exactly opposite okay it is exactly opposite as compared to what it is is it clear I hope it is clear to all of you now the second one requires some example where the government grants relates to non-depreciable asset now let me explain you this wait now let me give you an example the second one suppose the government is giving you a grant of 100 crore for buying some raw materials so you will pass a journal entry bank account debit 100 crore to government grant 100 crore and this is your balance sheet and in the balance sheet you will show government grant as what 100 crore and bank account as what 100 crore okay this is the first treatment now how to recognize this grant so now this grant is given by the government to you for what purpose for raw material for buying some raw materials so as and when you will meet the obligation as and when you will buy the raw material you have to recognize this grant suppose you have bought a raw material of 30 crores so now this is your PL account and now you will recognize government grant as 30 crores okay this is what the provision has to say the government grant shall be recognized as income over the same period during which the cost of obligation is charged to the income so as and when you will fulfill your obligation you will do what you will recognize that as income now therefore now the moment you will recognize this as income this will become how much pay attention please this will become how much this will become 70 crore now okay so this will become 70 crore this will become 70 crore now after this has become 70 crore okay now suppose if i do not fulfill the conditions in future and the, now the government says that you have to refund 100 crore because you are violating some conditions then what to do then what to do then you will be having 70 crore in your bank account you will give that amount and you will knock off this 70 crore you will pass an entry government grant account debit 70 crore to bank account how much 100 crore and the differential amount of 30 crore you have to bear back because that will be your expense now you have to bear that as an expense and that will go out of your pocket and that is what the treatment is all about the refundable amount that is 100 crore should be first applied against unamortized deferred credit how much is unamortized deferred credit 70 crore and the excess can be charged to PNL. How much is the excess? The excess is 30 crore. The 30 crore will be charged to what? Will be charged to PNL account. So this 100 crore has to be first adjusted against the unamortized credit and the 30 crore will be adjusted towards because that is your loss now because that has to be going from your pocket. So you have to pay that from your pocket and you have to adjust that. You can just take a photograph of this if you want. Okay, not very important for exam. Let me tell you very clearly but still it is there in your syllabus so we are doing it not very important okay don't worry much okay now so this is what the discussion of subsidy grant reimbursement is all about let's move on to the next part the next part is what the unabsorbed depreciation what is the treatment of unabsorbed depreciation under the income tax law section 32 subsection 2 talks about the treatment of unabsorbed depreciation pay attention please it's very unique as compared to the other losses generally what happens when you carry forward any loss you carry forward that loss for a particular period for four years for eight years right here the first advantage you can carry forward that for infinite number of years no limit time limit is not there this is the first advantage second advantage unabsorbed depreciation can be set off and carry forward and set off against any income except salary income 
So if you have an unabsorbed depreciation, you have to first set off against PGBP because it is related to business. And after that, if amount is left, you can set off against HP, you can set off against capital gains, you can set off against IFRS also, but not against salary. So this is the two biggest advantage of unabsorbed depreciation. First, no time limit. You can carry forward and set off for infinite number of years. Second, you can set off against any income except what? Salary income. Now, there is one very important thing which we have to keep it in our mind. Pay attention please all of you. Pay attention. Suppose my PGBP is 10 crore and I have three things. I have business loss, I have UAD, I have current year depreciation. And my business loss is what? Business income is how much? 10 crore. Suppose my business loss is 5 crore and this is 6 crore and this is 7 crore. Then what will be my priority of set off? What will I set off first against this? Then what? Then what? Always remember, the first priority will be to current year depreciation. Why? Because it is mandatory to claim depreciation. Mandatory, mandatory, mandatory to claim depreciation. Always first this. Always remember the second priority should be this. Should be this. Why, 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 why? Because this will get lapsed after some year. It will get lapsed now after some year if you do not set off this. Because it will, it is, it, it is coming with a time limit. It is coming with an expiry. So, it will lapse after 8 years. The third priority will be this. What is this? What is UAD? That is UAD. You will take UAD at the end, please. Do not consider UAD at the beginning. This has to be your priority. Number 1 this, number 2 this, number 3 this. I have told you with logic. Why number 1, why number 2, why number 3? Okay. Now, pay attention over here. Number 1, current and depreciation. Number 2, broad forward loss. Number 3, unabsorbed depreciation. There is something written in the bracket. We will be talking about that after some time. Do not worry about it. Okay. So, we will stop the discussion of depreciation here. Otherwise, it will be too much of depreciation for us in a day. And we will continue the discussion of depreciation in subsequent lectures. And do not worry, we will be doing a lot of questions also. Do not worry about it. Okay. There will be sufficient questions we will be doing in the class itself. Okay. So, take care all of you. I hope you all are enjoying the CA final direct tax fast by fast. Take care.